going to talk a little bit about a personal process that we've been going through in the office, no? And um, I'm going to start, uh, I mean, the lecture is called Contagious Risk. And I think this has a lot to do with what we were talking about or what you guys were talking about. And um, we have always feared contact, no? Being, being infected by the other, what may result as a possible threat to us. But what we don't know or what we, we, we fear. Um, uh, we were, we've been taught like this for, for a while now, no? to be uh, afraid of the, what's outside, what might be contagious. And um, I started really, really going deep into this conversation, uh, coming from Mexico City, and um, especially in a place where you can't avoid being uh, in contact with other people, no? And with the outburst of the, of the swine flu, no? uh, it became something that I really uh, uh, was really surprised, not only because uh, what was happening because the media outburst and don't go out of the streets and be careful with, with everybody you know. And in a country like Mexico where you eventually hug everybody and you, there, there's a lot of contact, you touch, you kiss. Uh, uh, I mean, there, w there was a point where everybody was wearing masks and you would say hi like robots. No? It was really, really surprising to see all these, all these uh, uh, images of people, kids playing, mimicking what they were seeing adults do. No? It was, oh, it's fun. So they would put masks to their... Uh, dolls, and uh, I think this is, this is not where, but, but eventually this, this started like, like uh, uh, making me question all these things, uh, and especially as I was saying, you know, coming from Mexico City in a very chaotic place where nothing works as it should, I'm glad that I'm Mexican, I couldn't be prouder to live in a place where uh, you eventually want to walk in the street and you're almost hit by a, a public transportation bus, pesero uh, as we know it, or you get in a taxi and they kind of spin you around. And I mean, we've all heard all these uh, crazy stories that are happening in the, in the city, but, it, but it's a place where you're always challenged, not only as an architect, no? and this is what I was hearing about you guys talking about, what, what, can you, uh, architecture, what type of architecture you can see to make you passionate. And I think you have to be passionate in everything you do, not only architecture. And Mexico really, really challenges you, uh, challenges you mentally uh, to think of everything, not only as an architect, but as a father, as a friend, as a human, uh, just walking and living the street every day, uh, running away from the drug lords. Nah, <laughs> all the bad press and everything. But uh, anyway, but, uh, and that started making me question. This is my father, who's uh, fortunate, I'm fortunate enough for him uh, being here. But uh, even when you're, when you're a little kid and you're questioning, uh, you're growing up and you're, you're asking yourself, who do I have to be like? No, my mom, my dad, why do I have to choose, make all these decisions? Uh, do I have to be uh, more influenced by my mother or my father? My father has a National Science, uh, National Science Prize in Mexico City, which we're very proud of, and my mom who went to India to look for her guru. And um, um, so it's this idea about do you, uh, what happens uh, between your family, what happens between professions. This is me, and please don't laugh, it was, uh, I mean, I was playing drums in a band professionally for 10 years. Uh, we cut four albums with uh, Virgin Records, and I was doing an uh, architecture at the same time. I was sleeping for hours. I still sleep really uh, just a few hours. But uh, it was incredible that I was studying, and I had a lot of professors telling me to drop off school, telling me that I would never be an architect because they were all already seeing me uh, uh, in TV shows, or we had videos in MTV at that time, and uh, so they were like, don't waste my time, drop out of school, and, and just be a musician. And that only made me be more stubborn and say, well, I mean, I'm, I'm here as an architect, so judge my work, and if I'm not good, I'll think of dropping out, but don't judge because I'm doing an, some other stuff. So that all, again, was something that I started questioning about, and I was doing, uh, these are the first jobs that we did in Mexico when I teamed up with Isaac Broy and Miquel. Uh, we did the F2 house for... And one of my clients, this was, uh, I think, an architectural record in 2001, maybe. Uh, we did public uh, buildings for the government. Uh, we even tried to get a shot at residential. No? I, I remember this project. This is a, the inside of a unit where we were uh, wanting to get a really, really a nice result of the public space, which no uh, developer wants to have anymore because they can't sell the public space in the building. They are only focused on how many square meters they can sell. And uh, this is a project where we ask money to our friends, family, everybody we knew. We bought a piece of property. We, uh, we thought we could do it, and we found out we couldn't. No, I mean, at the end, we finished the project. We, we eventually barely made it back to paying our uh, friends and relatives who lent us the money at the time. 
but we were really happy with the idea of, uh, or, or concern about what's happening to all the things that are being developed uh, in, in our cities. Uh, one of the important things is that by this time when I was with Isaac and Miquel, we were really, I don't know if it has to be with a musical influence, but uh, we were really concerned about not being tagged of only doing retail or only doing residential or only doing commercial uh, uh, office buildings. Uh, because at least that's happened, that happened with music, no? when you're playing in a band, like, what, what type of music you play, and everybody wants to tag you in a way. So when we started doing architecture, we wanted to just design. We didn't care if it was a small space, a big space. We didn't care if it was for the government or for a private commission. And, that, and, and most importantly, we wanted to avoid uh, just getting ourselves into a, a specific uh, realm. We did interior design, which we keep on doing. Uh, but then when I was, uh, uh, we worked together for almost three years, and then I started knowing that we were getting in a comfort zone where I didn't want to be, you know, this idea of we already knew, well, with my two partners, I mean, when I was with Isaac and Miguel, which they're really good friends now, but uh, every time a new project came in, we were designing it in the same manner, and there was something really disturbing about that, that I, that I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't want to feel like this uh, rap person, uh, uh, and, and being wrapped by myself, not by anybody else, but by, by my own uh, way of doing things. So I split up uh, in that firm uh, in 2002 and started on my own. And I didn't start on my own again, so I would not collaborate or would not partner. I started on my own to choose with, with whom I would want to collaborate. Um, because I love uh, uh, collaborations, and I think uh, this is uh, something at least I, I feel part of a, a generation that, that's more into networking and seeing how you can uh, make better uh, teams. And this is a project that we work with uh, Bjarke Engels from, from Big, from Denmark. Uh, we became good friends in a competition, and then um, uh, he was in Mexico for a lecture, and I invited him to do a project where we were doing a, a, an extension for the Tamayo Museum in Mexico City. And uh, we only had one, one month for the competition, but the incredible thing is that because uh, the hour difference, we were Skyping all day. You know? We were working 24 hours continuously, uh, working on the ideas uh, of how... Big uh, elevator pit, according yeah, that's, to that's the audience. Last time we met. Six, 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 an hour. And, um, but basically the project, in, uh, uh, it was on the outskirts of, the, of Mexico, in the, in the state of Mexico, in Atizapan, and it's the first time we were invited to a competition where they give you like a binder, like maybe 1,000 pages, but they're really neurotic, and they give you the floor plans. They give you a diagram, but the worst thing is that they really gave us floor plans. They said, well, these are more or less the offices we want, and you, they, they even drew the doors, no? So they're like, why do we invite architects to do a competition if you're already giving them uh, the floor plans, no? But Bjarke uh, and me, we kind of sarcastically, I mean, we went in different directions, but sarcastically then came back, and we said, well, if they're really sure they want this, they want this exact diagram, and it does work, but the only problem is that it sits on a hill. I mean, how, let's just figure out how we're going to cantilever this thing, and let's give, them, let's give them the cross that they designed at the beginning. So uh, it worked really well, function-wise. Uh, we were talking about uh, giving them uh, from white cube to a white cross. Um, we all know some, uh, uh, some private... Uh, 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 galleries who have their, their, their pieces of art and they invite people and they, they open up to the public. But uh, in Mexico, we never had a museum that, also, besides having the, the exhibition space, that it could be open uh, all the storage space to the public so we could witness how the art comes in and, and, and see how they uh, eventually take the, the, the art out of the, out of the boxes and exhibit it and, or, or prepare the art even to go to a different exhibition area. It, what we even tried to do is we tried to create a, a, a skin that would go outside the building, or, I mean, or a circulation. You would have a ramp, you would have some staircases, and another circulation to create an outer environment or another skin uh, to permit us not to only have an enclosed box that would uh, uh, house the art or the storage space, so we would have a perforated facade uh, of the building. Uh, the idea, we would do uh, some uh, bricks glazed bricks that, with a Mexican company. We're always really concerned on, on how to do a, a, a stuff with, a, with the local workers, doesn't matter where we are, but to understand what the, the capabilities are and how to really ex work to the maximum that, that part. A little bit of how the, the project works structurally, so the, the cross is touching in two corners and then it cantilevers two sides. And that's the, where the, 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 the main gallery for the art exhibition would be. And um, which would eventually connect to the interior. And everything is kind of extroverted. The idea is that you would eventually, uh, again, would have open spaces that you could enclose if you want or, or leave them as open and 
the way it cantilevers over this hillside and um, a bit of a, uh, the idea that, that we used uh, or Bjarke has been using about creating the topography or like, like a shadow projected from the cross and create a topography like architects represented in physical models. No? So we created these staircases that go to the, uh, to the workshops and to the cafeteria which is underneath so you're kind of in this really nice uh, uh, protected uh, space. Um, some cross sections. This is the actual uh, view you would have from Atizapan. And uh, you would park your car next to, uh, in the upper part of the hill and then just walk down to the rooftop of, this of the building and then eventually start coming down. This is the idea of the building uh, cantilevering on the site. And some idea of the, of the exhibition spaces, different formats of artists that they want to see how it would look on the space. And, um, and eventually, uh, this is some of the typical things that happen in Mexico. Uh, the project is on standby because the, um, uh, one political party, the PRI, uh, the PRI uh, had given the, the site when the, when the competition w it took place, but then uh, the other political party won. And uh, when the guys came in, they said, no, we don't want to give the lot away, so we don't want you to take the credit for uh, the new museum that's going to be there. So uh, a project and, a, and a, a competition that rarely happens in Mexico that took place and we won is now uh, on a string because of political decisions. No? Um, and, and then uh, coming back a little bit to, to understanding this contagious process no? or, or how we are able to, to really uh, 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 let ourselves uh, um, be contaminated by ideas of others. Uh, we started working, this is my first commission when I started Rojkin Arquitectos in 2002. Uh, it's a house for a ballerina dancer and uh, I, ironically the house, I mean, my client hired me and then he said, well, you know what, I have an, a house that I want you to redesign, but on top of the house I want you to put my, uh, uh, an apartment for my daughter because I want her to be independent. And uh, I, I, I was saying ironically because why do you want to have her independent and put her upstairs? I mean, send her to live somewhere else but not on top of your house. And especially don't put cameras on her house. No? But, uh, uh, he insisted that he wanted this uh, house on the rooftop and to me that was the most exciting part because uh, we refurbished the house but we, uh, it was the first time I sat down with a client and I really understood that projects, they do change programmatically. You know? I mean if you're doing a house, somebody might want a bigger kitchen, a bigger bathroom, but it never changes that drastically. It's more or less the same. We haven't changed that much uh, in the way we live. But uh, what, what does change is the client sitting in front of you and we normally, uh, or before I didn't pay much attention to that, I would just hear the program. And here we just sat down with her and started listening. I mean, she was a 19 year old ballet dancer, she just had a scholarship to go to Russia. And uh, it was mind blowing uh, uh, how I, I, I came back to really understanding how I would design because I remember coming out from school, I would have my, my uh, a sketchbook and a pen in my pocket, which I normally still carry. But uh, if I was with a client, I would never listen to the client. I would hear him like, wah, 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 while you were sketching all your ideas because you think you have all these brilliant ideas in your head. And, uh, and I understood that, that by this point in 2001, I, I wanted it to become a process where I really fed off the client, off the budget, off the timeline, off everything that really was important. And if I was not able to give them a program that really worked in the best way possible, then I was not really an architect, no? So I would, it's not that I would take for granted the program, but I would really focus on more of the other parts to understand what uh, I really could uh, give my client. And for instance, the, the house that sits on, it, it has a split level, and the reason why it has a split level is because there was a maid's quarter on top of the house. And uh, so there was a, already an existing bump, so we placed the public part on top of the bump, and then the private part came half level, half level down. Uh, this is the house sitting on top of the the father's house as he wanted. <laughs> and um, a very simple floor plan, no? 140 me square meters. And we were working on the house and something that, that really uh, um, was also uh, very important to me at that time or really shifted me in, in different directions is I think we always, we always tend to complain where we come from. No? There's always something wrong where, where we're from. No? Ah, things don't work as we want and we don't have these great companies. There's not really good clients. And I was one of those also, you know, at some point. And, uh, but then I started understanding that really Mexico was an incredible place to build because you have labor, wor labor. I mean, the guys that work in not only architecture, but in different industries, they really do a good job. 
So when we were working on this project, I remember uh, we had a steel frame. We were covering the, the, the steel I-beams with, a, 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 with steel panels. Obviously, we put some acoustical and thermical isolation, all the technical stuff that uh, you could see in, 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 in the project if you find it in the internet or, or, or in publications. But what was important is that we came to a point where, where the, the steel was not as I really expected it to be. So I remember going to this place in Mexico called Colonia Doctores. And Colonia Doctores is, is a place where if, uh, when I was borrowing my father's car for the first time and he would uh, not know about it, and my mom would give it, say, okay, go before your father comes back. And I would crash it or scratch it in a way. You would take it there and like in 40 minutes they would really uh, polish it and leave it, leave it spick and span. They would take the bumps out while you were having some tacos in the corner. And then uh, you would come back and nobody would notice that you crashed the car, no? So uh, I remember these guys and I ran guys I said, why don't I go f look for them, bring them to the construction site and see what happens, no? And uh, I did go pick these guys up. We went to the construction site. Everybody thought I was crazy. The, the original contractor who thought he was doing a great job because also in Mexico, the contractors believe they can do everything. No, they're not specialists in everything, but they said, ah, steel, don't worry, we'll do the best job you can ever imagine. And uh, when we brought these guys in, they really, really worked the, the, the project in an amazing way. And I got it cheaper than the original budget. And, uh, and I was really excited to really uh, be swirling a little bit of, the, uh, of what my head was uh, uh, thinking of only the architectural solutions. No? So this is another thing for you guys to think that you don't only have to think what happens in, in architecture. No? You, you have to open up your minds to what's happening around you, especially what happens in the places that you're going to be working. And this is how the, hi, the, the house sits uh, on the uh, crazy side in Tecamachalco uh, in Mexico. Um, uh, this is uh, also another project that we worked, uh, Falcon headquarters, but it was a little bit of the same idea. I started working with, with different uh, workers to do different uh, uh, types of, uh, of detailed uh, skills, and I, I call this process uh, the idea of from digital design to local fabrication, no? because we always we tend to work in a digital environment. I love, I really love as far as technology can take us uh, to understand what spatial qualities we can get, what uh, 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 to enhance more the qualities of using the, the, the right uh, locations and, and, and geographical conditions. Uh, but then you come down to the labor worker who's there waiting for the floor, I mean for the drawings, to, so he can start working. Um, and the idea about contagious strategies, I'm going to jump really quick to the Nestle project that we did. And this, again, uh, also agreeing uh, uh, with Martin with, about strategies. We, we tend not to wait for clients. I think we're not in a, I mean, we were never in a point where we would wait for clients, or at least that's my way of seeing things. But after the crisis, I think every, everything got a heads up. No, I mean, Mexico's always been in crisis, so it was not that bad. But, um, but uh, it, we're, we've always been thinking of how to design strategies to be able to design. And this is one clear uh, uh, example about that. We were called by Nestle uh, to uh, do a competition for the chocolate factory. So we were called just to do a tunnel because they wanted to brand their company even, even more. No? So they, they wanted school, uh, uh, school buses to come with the kids and they give them a tour through these tunnels so they could witness the production of chocolate and really, uh, in, in their way, it was a cultural thing. In my way, it was like they just wanted to brand and <laughs> the kids. No? So uh, I remember uh, driving to the place, it, it took us almost 40 minutes to get from Mexico uh, to Toluca, which is uh, uh, outside, uh, uh, well, almost close to Toluca. And I really got depressed because I was imagining a kid going on a school bus, driving for 40 minutes, imagining Willy Wonka or something fabulous in a chocolate factory, and then just hitting a generic factory after another in a really awful site, which is really, really industrial. So instead of... Um, Instead of uh, uh, not doing the competition or, or just saying, oh, we could have done something else, we did do something else. We did some research and we came back to the client and we said, okay, this is what you wanted, but give me one more minute and I want to present to you another thing. And we told him, well, this is your drop-off. This is the gray part in the, uh, that you see here is the, the tunnel, the bridge that they wanted. But we were aiming to do a new project where we said, 
we calculated how many cars pass through this important uh, freeway that connects Mexico to Toluca. It has like four lanes. Uh, this is one of the side lanes, but it has four lanes with almost 16, 16 uh, uh, car lanes both ways. We told them that it would be incredible if we had a chocolate museum, which ironically, again, Mexico, uh, where Aztecs invented chocolate as a trading uh, method, and then, as we know, the Spaniards took it away, and then 100 years later it was brought back sweetened, as we all know, chocolate today. Why didn't we have a museum of chocolate if they really wanted to uh, brand uh, the company as a cultural uh, um, or, or to do something cultural for society? Why not really, really do it and do a, a chocolate museum? Um, fortunately, the vice president got really excited with the presentation. He went to Switzerland. He presented. He came back and he, he told me uh, one good news and one bad news. The good news is that we were going to do the project, not, not complete, only the entrance of the project with a, with a bit of with some part of the cultural, uh, the, the, I mean, uh, a theater and a, and a store at the, uh, and the entrance and, and continue on phase two later. But the bad news is that we had two months and a half to do the project. Uh, uh, I thought two months and a half was not bad if we hired, I don't know how many hundreds of people to help us do all the drafting in the CDs. And he said, no, two months and a half to have it built because they were going to have an opening. And uh, we, I, I always joke that we passed from the small scale to the bigger scale to the one-to-one -one scale on site. We moved almost all of the office, uh, well, all of the office, I think. Now we're the most that we've ever been, and we're 20. So by this time, I think we were nine at the office. And uh, we, we moved part of the office there. And uh, some of the drawings that you see here were literally finished when we finished the project. So... Uh, <laughs> It was you had to make decisions on site, which I love. I, I, I love being on site because I, I'm one of these uh, uh, obsessive architects that believe that everything you draw, it has to be built. No, I, 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 I don't get easily satisfied by just having a cool render. No, I get really frustrated when projects don't get to happen. But uh, this is a little bit of the floor plan uh, when you get in the entrance and you, you will notice like a really, really raw cut section here. And uh, we did it, our, uh, 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 that was the intention, so we could understand that that was the part that was going to continue afterwards. And again, these drawings that were finished later, cross sections, and this was a little bit of the idea. Pour the foundation in concrete would really, uh, so we could really uh, drive fast with, a, with all these new products that you have, and then have the steel structure uh, um, be cut on site, uh, do a main uh, prelim, uh, primary structure, secondary structure, and then be covering the skin. Um, this is a, how the site looked here. You see the, the, the I-beams even on the floor uh, as they were being cut. We were tracing them on the floor, and uh, the iron workers were there. It, it, was, it was literally really, really crazy because it was, uh, we had people doing eight-hour shifts. So if you would explain something to the iron workers or to the steel workers, uh, you would have to come back eight, eight hours later to explain to the next shift because obviously... The other guys went to sleep, and then you, were, uh, you had to, I mean, really have uh, good communication with the people on, on, on site, and, and as I was explaining, make them understand how to do things that, I mean, these workers in there, they were thinking that uh, they didn't know, uh, they didn't understand the drawings, we were taking them, bringing them physical models, we were giving them rendering so they can understand the project, and uh, it took us a little time, but after uh, bonding with all of the workers, we actually uh, eventually got them working in the right direction, especially for the amount of time that we had. Um, I always say that Murphy's Law is real, no? Uh, the two months and a half we had it were, were, were a disaster, no? It was not rainy season and it rained. Everything that could happen, it, it happened. And uh, I love the chaos of the images. I, I remember showing these images to some friends uh, in Europe and they're like, what? The, the site is a mess. This is a disaster. They would shut down a site like this in any other part of the world, no? But, uh, but this, is, this is Mexico, no? I mean, that's the, the, the beauty of the, of, of the chaotic uh, uh, environment. But anyway, we were doing acoustical and thermical isolation. And we were finishing almost the project. Uh, we used materials that uh, uh, the companies had in stock. We, we didn't even have time to, to um, uh, choose a, a big selection of, of, of things. But that was a good trade-off, because on one hand, you have a client telling you you have to finish in a certain amount of time. And on the other hand, you tell them, OK, we can do it. But you can't blink. I mean, you can't even say you didn't like the, the, the lighting fixture, because I'm not, I'm not going to have time to change it. So that's a good trade-off. No? You get to 
do a project where the client trusts you to, to finish from, from uh, the beginning to, to, to the opening. This, this is our staff. They were really, really excited about uh, finishing uh, the project. We were almost, almost on time. And this is the, the day of the opening. And this is our friend, which, uh, again, uh, a little bit of what happens in Mexico. Until that day, I really found out why we needed to finish in two months and a half. This is Enrique Peña Nieto, the governor of the state of Mexico, and he's possibly going to be our new president. And uh, he had done a deal with Nestle that if he could give his political speech in two months and a half, uh, Nestle would not need permits to build the new uh, addition to the company. <laughs> So uh, here you see my friend Pierluigi with a really fake smile, like <laughs> saying, welcome. And this was when, when Nina was, uh, uh, my daughter, who's also sitting here in front, she was two years old by, by then, no, two, three, almost three. And I was uh, really excited to take her to a chocolate museum because normally you don't have cool projects, no? You, I mean, she, you take her to a house, I mean, she doesn't get excited. So I, I thought, it, I mean, a chocolate museum would be really cool. So as obsessive as a father can be and an architect, I was taking her to see all those little details and look at this and see how the light uh, turns on here. And when we came out and I asked her what was her best feature, she obviously had grabbed these uh, plastic jugs and stuffed chocolate inside of them in the store. So she thought like, that. the store is the most amazing thing, you know? And uh, she didn't care about anything else, but... This is the project uh, as we finished it. And this, this is uh, one of the ideas that I was really imagining. You know, the, not only, I, I'm, o I'm always concerned about this idea. You know? We're doing projects, and, and I was thinking of kids, but then I was thinking, I mean, I, I, don't, don't, I don't, don't want to do this only for the kids. I was wanting to create an entrance that was really impressive for kids when they, dropped off, I mean, when they came out of the, of, the, of the school bus, but even for adults, you know, when you're taking your kids, I mean, I, I, I always criticize that we, when we're growing up, we tend to get we tend to be really boring, no? We, we forget about how to have fun, and we forget about all these amazing things that I love. Uh, that's why I love playing with, a lot with my daughter, because I really, uh, uh, I really regret that I, I had lost some things that I wish I'm, I'm recovering, no? Uh, while I see how she views her life. And, uh, and this idea of, of really entering a new world, entering a new sensation or a new place that uh, uh, could be very typical, ah, yeah, chocolate, as we know, with uh, another company, but really understanding how we could do something for this company. And they have, they, they've gotten really, really good results, uh, it, really uh, in, a, in a very good way. And we were even called back to do another project with them. We were, we were called back to do, uh, they called us again, and uh, they, they, they invited us to do a project in Querétaro. And funny, because the, the, the vice president said, well, I want you to do a new red thing, no? And I said, well, why would we do another red thing? That was already done in Toluca, and that's for your chocolate factory. What is this new thing? And the new thing is a, la a, a, a lab in, in Querétaro, which is a UNESCO heritage, the, the center of Querétaro. So we were uh, thinking of a new lab that Nesta was getting together with um, L'Oreal to do digestible cosmetics, which is really uh, strange because now it seems you're going to eat a cookie and, get a and have a facial cream by eating a, a cookie, you know? Or if you want to get a suntan, you eat a, a chocolate. So uh, they're working now from the inside out, which I'm not, I'm not too convinced. But anyway, um, it, it was a good idea to create like this incredible new place where they were going to create all these crazy food. But uh, <clears throat> then the, <clears throat> the municipality in Querétaro came up to us and they said, well, guys, you're not in the city center, but you know what? We want all the new buildings to have something relating to the city center because we're a UNESCO heritage, so we want you to create arches for the building. So we said, what are you talking about? I mean, yeah, a portico, something nice that would eventually give something back to the city. And uh, at some other point in, our, in my life, I would, I would have said, no, I mean, I have an incredible friend that does really cool arches and porticos, and I'll introduce you to him because we don't do porticos or arches, no? But, I think now we like the, the idea that taking elements that before we never, uh, I, I mean, not that we didn't appreciate, but we didn't have the, the, the vision of seeing how we could do reinterpretations of things. And we eventually did a reinterpretation of the arches. We didn't have to come up with a typical idea and, um, or the typical way of doing them. And we created these, well, this is the, the eighth version of the project because it was a bigger, bigger project and it had like eight, uh, <laughs> down sizes, budget cuts, and, and stuff. And we ended up with three small elements that connect to each other, where you have the, the uh, prototype floor, the lab, 
uh, and then you have on the upper part a tasting areas, uh, another a smaller auditorium, and then some office space. And then uh, we started playing around with what, ha what would happen to these reinterpretations of, 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 of these arches. And again, uh, understanding this idea of digital design to local fabrication, it, it looked really cool in the computer. No? You were seeing all the different angles, and then you said, okay, now how are we going to tell the guys how to build it? No? Because I always, I, I, I want to do like a short film when the architect finishes his, his CDs and he hands it over to the client and the client has already chosen the contract and he gives it to the contractor and you see the contract really, uh, he's, he's really, really uh, confident of himself with the client. He says, yeah, we're going to do this incredibly smooth and you're going to see we're, we're the best you can ever hire. And then this, the general contractor gives it to his second on board, which is kind of doubting a little bit, and then he gives it to the other guy, and then to the other guy, and the last guy in the chain who receives the drawing, he's clueless, and he doesn't know how to do with any of the things that you're trying to carefully design on the, on the project, and, and the owner of the company is not even going to be there. So uh, we, did, we even tried to come up with a system of how we were going to tell the, the, the basic local uh, workers how to do the job. And uh, we, obviously, we know how to do these uh, bovedas or these, uh, 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 ah, I forgot how you say it in English. But uh, in Mexico, we, we've done a lot before, but not in the way that we wanted. So we came up with an idea of, instead of giving them these drawings where you have uh, all the uh, 3D exploded uh, versions, we came back to really elemental, uh, where you have just a diameter of Wii bars and then the height of the Wii bars. We ended up building all of them, which was, which was really simple, or it was easier to do, and then cut off all the intersections of the Wii bars when, when we wanted the... Uh, the only part where I was a little bit more uh, obsessed was uh, that I wanted the, the, the intersection of the two geometries to really have a CNC cut that was uh, really affordable uh, for the only, um, uh, or the only advanced tool that we would have on the project. Uh, this is what we had requested. We, the Wii bars would eventually have a, a, a mesh finish and then splattered concrete. And uh, the contractor got really creative, as most times happen, and uh, he said that we were going to waste his time and it was going to be more expensive. So he proposed that he sprayed foam on the structure and it would be much easier. Uh, fortunately, I came one day and took a picture of this guy with his mask and I sent it to the vice president again, telling him it was the most hazardous site in the world, that it, we could not work like this, that if he was looking for doing things the right way, this was the wrong way of doing it. Uh, he panicked. Uh, I obviously exaggerated a bit more. I was telling him that there was a worker that... It was not breathing right that day, so uh, <laughs> they peeled everything off, and uh, we got it to finish as we, we, uh, we had proposed at the beginning. This is the final result of the building. Um, and uh, again, we were trying to do this idea of this, these labs where the upper part, uh, it's, everything is, uh, actually it's a mirror finish. It, it, it's a, a mirror with a with acid, when you acid washed on the outside, so the mirror is blurred and it looks like this metallic uh, element on the, on the outside. And the upper part, uh, you have all these windows that can open, but when it's closed, it looks a bit more uh, uh, secret or uh, provocative. And then the, uh, the, uh, underneath, you see all these guys in their white robes passing by. Uh, somebody said it looked like the Teletubbies house. I don't know if... You know. But they're happy. I, I've, I've spoken to the, the workers. They're really excited because they, even their orange light on the inside and they're connected to the garden. So they say that they've never had labs like this to work in. And even we try to make a, uh, we can get to the landscape, but we got at least to the, uh, to the entrance where we kind of uh, uh, popped out the idea of the, of, the, of the arches. We were aiming to get all these bubbles on the landscape as well, which we, we never uh, finished. And this is a bit how it connects the outside some of the colors on the inside. And, and this process of digital design to local fabrication has been happening over and over. Now, this is in the case of a new restaurant we're doing in Mexico. Um, and you have the process, you go over, uh, you see how you, you can make it happen, you get finish the design, you see the cheapest way of achieving it. Because again, uh, most of the clients that come to us that want to experiment more in, our, in, in architecture, push in a, in, in a, in a, in a better direction design-wise or, 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 or some projects that give a little bit back, most of them don't have a lot of money. So they say, oh, yeah, I like it, but uh, can we do it in a really, really uh, cheap version of it? So uh, I guess we're always waiting for like, the, the really big clients, but I guess, we, I mean, I've never had a friend getting like, all the really good clients, no? You never, 
Uh, but to me, these are the, the, the best clients that we, that we have, and it's great to work with them because you also have to be creative on how to get these things done. This is uh, some pictures that was taken last week of how the structure is appearing on the... On the it's, it's a Japanese restaurant. Um, and then I talk when... I, we're also a generation that we brag a lot about risking, no? Yeah, we, we, we don't follow all the regular rules and we risk more and we're... But, but then again, I mean, we have to really be careful because I think, I think other generations didn't share as much or they, they share information, but maybe they did not, not in the way that, that we do now, no? With all this mass communication. And this is an image of me with a broken collarbone. And uh, I say when risk is not enough because I'm always still trying things, but it doesn't matter if I end up in a hospital with a titanium uh, uh, nail in my uh, uh, clavicle, collarbone, I was forgetting. And I say that, what, what are we learning? No, we've done commissions uh, for clients in the Middle East that they were not even the owners of the sites. No, and they would do like private invitations for, for commissions. And I was competing against Fuxas and Asimtor and I was thinking that this was for real. And two years later, we found out that they were not even the owners of the site, as I was saying or some other clients that they invite you to uh, other competitions, but then uh, nobody wins, and then they're building one of the architect's projects no? uh, out of the competition drawings, which is crazy. And for instance, I know if you guys are aware of what happened in Ordos in Mongolia, uh, Ordos 100 was a project uh, curated by Herzog and Demoron, and then given to Ai Weiwei, so he can invite 100 architects to do 100 villas in Mongolia which was crazy, in, uh, as you see these images, no, 100 men in black walking in the deserts of, of Mongolia. And, uh, and uh, we all did 1,000 square meter villas, with each with an individual pool. It was, I mean, it was just crazy. But uh, the projects themselves, I don't want to, I, I mean, I think they're really great projects individually. But this idea of what are we learning, I think when you see the, the, the complete collection of houses, it's a mess. No, it's. It really, let me show you this image. I mean, it becomes a place where, I mean, you have 100 egos that barely fit, no? And, um, and the worst part is that we were, this is, this is the table where we had all the projects, no? And this is the client, Mr. Kai. And, uh, and at first you were really excited because you get invited to go to Mongolia, no? But then it was a really bad feeling when you were actually there because the client would be, have this big table and he would be going over the project with his friends, like, come and choose your house. So he was already selling your projects and you, I mean, you were just sitting down looking at the client and he would say, oh, who's this house? Ah, and he would lift, uh, he would have the architect come up and show the house. I mean, he was pimping us, no? And I mean, he was just <laughs> waiting for your turn, sitting down. It was, it was, a, I mean, a really bad experience. I mean, uh, we had a good time because of all our colleagues in the same place and we talked up, we, we finally catched up with, with what everybody was doing. But uh, uh, in the client's perspective, I don't know if uh, it, it was a thing that I would want to do again, but it, the idea or the important part for me uh, of this process was, was really what are we learning of, of, of these final results, no? And then I come back uh, to now that you know with who you want to work when you choose the right clients or the right people, and you talk about the contagious pleasures, no? Because we really try to have fun in the, in the process that we do, in the projects that we're doing in the office. Uh, we've given our shots to high rises, which have never happened, but we've been shortlisted in many competitions. Fortunately, uh, now we're, we're doing our first high rise in Mexico City, and uh, uh, it's a 200, uh, high, 200 meter high tower, which is a mixed use building. And to be honest, I think that the, the most, uh, the, the part that has me, uh, uh, or the part I'm mo most happy about is that there's a side street that was a, a blocked street that we're making it a pedestrian street and we're connecting it uh, in, to a part of the city which links Reforma Avenue, which is this new avenue in Mexico. And uh, it, it really starts creating a public realm underneath. And this is some of the images of the tower from the bottom part. I mean, obviously I'm excited about doing a high rise as well, no? but uh, uh, especially in a times, uh, uh, I mean, uh, crisis times. No, this is how uh, w uh, the tower is gonna look from the bottom. The idea of, of the facade comes from the, from the units on the inside. All the units have this glass pushed forward, so you get like two accentuated views to the sides. So all these triangle shapes actually are accentuating the views from one side to the other. Um, and we were really thinking of doing a, a really urban building. I think in Mexico, uh, we, the, the highest building or the tallest building we have is Torre Mayor, and it looks like a generic building uh, from any other uh, country, no? And, uh, 
and the, the taller buildings we have, they don't even look like a skyscraper, no? They're like uh, a regular size building, but on steroids, no? They just stretch them, but they're not really designed to look like a, a skyscraper. So we, we really went over this one back and forth to make it uh, really look like a building that would stand uh, as a new urban uh, project in, in our city. This is La Diana, uh, this is a roundabout in front of uh, you have also St. Regis there. And this is a place where zoning just recently changed about six months ago. And it was only, as you see, the adjacent buildings, it was really small. And now it's uh, from four stories. I mean, from 40 stories, uh, uh, you can go even higher depending on, on the, the area you are. And we we're 52 stories on this one. Uh, and just to close up, I want to show you a new project. This is a new company that we built, uh, or that we founded uh, from scratch. And we... we opened up this, com this company exactly on the time of the crisis, the economical crisis. And we created a company because we didn't want to be numb or we didn't want to be uh, uh, pushed down by the crisis. We didn't want to, most of our friends were really depressed. They were really complaining about everything that happened and now we're not going to work anymore. And the, I mean, it's useless to have an office now. And I mean, we all saw some friends shut down their offices, but uh, to us, it was more important to be uh, to have your, your mind exercised, no? not, to, not to think uh, all the, 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 uh, the bad things that were happening, but try to keep it working in a, very, uh, in a different way. I'm not talking only optimistical, but, but keep it working, no? because if your mind stops, uh, to me that's the end of, the, of, your, of, your, of your work. And Agent is a company that focuses on, on disruptive design. Uh, I teamed up with an industrial designer, and we were working uh, to see or, or looking for things that were out there, but nobody questioned, no? So we questioned, um, we questioned a, a soccer ball. We were questioning, and this was way before the World Cup, but it came out during the World Cup. We were questioning why, why nobody has done anything with the soccer ball. It only changes the, the, graf the, 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 uh, the graphic design on the outside, or maybe the stitches you don't see anymore, but it doesn't really evolve from that. So we created a, a transparent soccer ball that you would eventually, first of all, it's an airless soccer ball. We're using technology with polymers and elastomers that you already have in, in, in cars. That they first started experimenting it for war, obviously. You know, the, the tires that don't get uh, flat if, if they're punctured by a, by a bullet. And so we created, with, with these materials, uh, we proposed that you first you have a transparent ball that you can see through, that you have a structure on the inside. And second, you, you can start implementing technology. You, know, you could put a GPS system on the inside uh, so you can track the ball. If it goes inside the goal, it lights up. Uh, if it goes out of bounds, it lights up. Uh, it has a thermal pattern uh, material also on the outside. If somebody touches it with the hand, you know it was touched by the hand and not by some other fabric. And um, uh, so now we're, I mean, we presented it before. The World Cup, obviously, FIFA doesn't want any technology, as we all know, when we saw what was happening. But, but we're really uh, excited with the idea of, of having these uh, kind of products just come out and, and see what happens, you know, and see we're already talking to Nike, we're talking to Adidas as well, and uh, we're figuring out who we'd really want to team up in the company. And, uh, and the incredible part is it's still design, you no? Know? it doesn't matter the scale. Uh, and with this, I, I want to close just saying that uh, we don't want to work in isolation. No, I don't believe working in isolation. And we, I also uh, want to reinforce what you guys were talking about at the beginning of, uh, uh, of the talks, that uh, don't sit and wait, and don't wait or don't expect somebody to tell you how things work better or not. Question them and just go out there, no? Don't work, I, I, don't, I know there's a lot of people that do work really well in isolation. They, they're really well working in their office. I, I would never be able to perform like that. I'm always hooked up on the internet, on Twitter, every, I mean, uh, with all my colleagues asking how they're managing their offices, how they're managing their, product, th their projects. And um, it's really interesting because then you get re real life feedback from colleagues that are working in some other country and uh, are complaining about the same things or understanding how to do the, the same things. Uh, I want to break more bones. You know? <laughs> um, and I want to feel alive and risk. And I want to close just by saying that nevertheless, we know that without contact, and of course, a certain contagious risk, life does not endure, it does not change, it does not reproduce, and in one word, it does not live. I wanna jump out in the open, thank you. Michelle, thank you for being here and for these wonderful, stupendous presentations. You're both rock stars, you're great.
I'm sorry to say we have really run out of time. We cannot do the Q&A session. Um, but please join me in thanking Michelle and Martin for their great presentation. <laughs>